afternoon. Our speaker next week is going to be Eric Bradley. Eric is the Vice President for Strategy at IPR GDF Suez North America. That's a very large power generation and wholesale retail company. He's going to talk about a closer look at the gas value chain in power production. It gives me tremendous pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Arun Baskota. Arun is the president of Energy's, Energy Energy's Electric Vehicle Services. Arun is an industry stalwart. He has over 20 years of experience in developing, financing, and managing renewable and fossil energy uh, generation projects around the world. Before assuming his current position, Arun led Energy's Texas wholesale generation business with over 11,000 megawatts of generation uh, portfolio and over $1.2 billion in earnings. That's, that's a massive uh, portfolio and, and great leadership uh, right there and experience. Arun holds an MBA from the University of Chicago. And he's going to talk to us today about the EVgo network that he's building right now. Please join me in welcoming Arun. Thank you. Thank, thank you, uh, Varun. Can, uh, can you hear me at the back? Yeah, pretty good. Okay. So it's always good to be here at the UT. Uh, the Longhorns are very, very well represented at both NRG and EVgo. And in fact, at EVgo, I've got my uh, VP for products, uh, my general counsel, my head of marketing, and my head of uh, finance and administration are all Longhorns. So. I have to listen all of the time to your football stats and basketball stats and, and you name it. So I, <laughs> I, I almost feel like a Longhorn myself. Um, so uh, I want to talk a little bit today about a uh, couple of different kinds of uh, issues and, I, and, and please give me feedback at any time, right? So uh, the first is uh, really talk about some of the policy issues around electric vehicles. Um, and then I want to move to more like, you know, what, are, what is a startup business doing in this kind of an industry, and how, do we ro how did we roll out our business model as a startup industry? So those are going to be really the two uh, kinds of themes uh, that I'm covering. And if, if folks have a particular interest in anything else in the energy sector, I'm, I'm more than happy to uh, cover that as well. So just to kind of get a sense of the audience, how many have actually driven an electric vehicle? Wow. Okay. It's pretty pretty uh, uh, significant. I mean, when, when I started in this uh, business two years ago, you wouldn't see any hands raised. So this is, this is actually pretty significant, but I guess part of that is also being an uh, Austin audience, right? Um, so electric vehicles. There's already a, quite a number of models out there. Okay. Just to put things in context, every year in the U.S. we sell between 12 to 16 million electric vehicles. Okay? We are now around uh, 18 uh, months into electric vehicle introduction. And last month, 0.5% of all cars sold were electric vehicles. Now, is that large, is that small? If you listen to the media, you'll get all kinds of feedback, right? But if you want to keep that in context, it took hybrids five years to reach half percent. So in comparison, actually, electric vehicles are taking off pretty well, okay? The other thing that gives me a lot of optimism is that there's a lot of industry investments in the sector. And when you, look at, when you look at the electric vehicle value chain, you can really look at it in, in, in the form of like four different buckets. So you have electric vehicle, we call them OEMs, original eco manufacturers, the Nissans, the Teslas of the world. They've already invested over $10 billion. Okay? The other major part of the value chain is, are, are the battery original eco manufacturers. Uh, from uh, Dow to Johnson Controls to Samsung to LG, you name it. They've invested another more than $10 billion. And then you've got another space of charger manufacturers from GE to ABB to, to, to the smallest mom and pop uh, startups. And there's around a billion dollar plus investment in that space. And then we occupy a pretty interesting space that's more like the 
owner, manager, operator of electric vehicle infrastructure. Okay? So what gives me a lot of optimism is that there's a lot of uh, investments being made into that space. Unlike back in the 1990s, before you guys were born, when there, there was EV1 and there was only one manufacturer, General Motors, and so there was a lot of question about whether that's going to survive or not. But now, electric vehicles are here to stay. The only question is how fast will the adoption be? That's really the only question. Our projections are that you know, by the end of 2014, there's going to be more than 30 different models of electric vehicles on the road. And by the year 2020, when the US is projected to sell 20 million cars a year, projections are 2 million of those. So around 10% of those are going to be electric vehicles. But who knows, right? I mean, it's a new space, a new um, uh, industry, so a lot of more questions than, than answers, really. And, and so let me uh, go into a couple of policy issues that I think is very important for folks to know about the electric vehicle space. First, you might be surprised to know that electric vehicles already today, the first generation EVs are cheaper than a gas gasoline car. Okay? Now, key difference, you got to look at the five-year cost of ownership. Okay? So if you look at sticker price, cost of maintenance, and cost of fueling, and this is a study from Bloomberg, and Consumer Reports has done st uh, studies on that. A number of other independent sources have done studies uh, on that. Already the first generation electric vehicle, when you look at a five-year cost of ownership, is cheaper than any other car, even cheaper than a Toyota Prius hybrid, which everybody thinks is a, is a fairly cheap uh, form of transport. Now, what is really amazing when you're in the space is how challenging it is to change people's mindset. When people have been buying a car for 100 years based on a sticker price, for you to now go out there and convince people that you should be really looking at it from a cost of ownership perspective, and you need to factor in maintenance costs and factor in your fueling costs is an amazingly difficult challenge. Okay? I mean, I'll, just, I'll just give you an example on fueling costs. Okay? If you drive 12,000 miles, in an internal combustion engine car that says, let's say, has 20 miles per gallon uh, efficiency. So you need 600 gallons a year, right? Say $4 a gallon uh, gasoline, $2,400 a year to drive those 12,000 miles. To drive the same miles, 12,000 miles in an electric vehicle, it'll take you 3,000 kilowatt hours. In Texas here today, we have 10 cents per kilowatt hour on average. It'll cost you $300 a year. $2,400 versus $300, okay? Uh, my uh, mechanic uh, service, you know, in six months told me I needed to come in for maintenance. So I drove it into the shop, and he looks at the car and says, sir, we must have made a mistake. You're driving an electric vehicle. We don't need to do anything. So, okay. I, came, I took, it, took it back one year when they sent me another notice. He said, all we need to do is 10 minutes of, of uh, service on your car. Rotate the tires. That's it. Okay? So you're going to have a huge amount of savings on maintenance costs as well. So when you look at all three elements, you know, and you look at a total cost of ownership, it's already the cheapest form of transport. Second, uh, um, well, this is along the same lines. And, and one of the reasons for that is you look at electricity, electricity cost. Oops. Doesn't work for some reason. Yeah. Yeah, it works here, but not on the screen, I guess. So you look at the blue line, right? That shows you from 1976 how stable electricity prices have been. And you look at the red line, and that's your gasoline prices. Okay? Huge amount of spikes. And the basic reason for that is that gasoline is not a market price. Gasoline is a cartel price. Okay? There, there's a bunch of large producers who sit down together in, in, in a dark room, smoke-filled room, and they decide, what is the price I want? And based upon that, how much should be produced to kind of bring supply and demand into balance at a pre-designated price? Okay? And where they are today is that they think 
$100 is the kind of right price per barrel of oil. And that's the reason that, why you see anytime there's a slight issue, whether one refinery goes down or, or, or a tanker goes down or something, you see huge spikes because it takes time for those same folks to get back into that room and reallocate the quotas, right? And that's why you see supply-demand imbalance because gasoline is not a market price. It is a cartel price, okay? Another huge issue around policy issue around uh, electric vehicles, uh, air emissions, uh, environmental, whatever you might want to call it. We don't talk about greenhouse gas anymore. We don't talk about climate change anymore. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's become a huge political uh, you know, football out there, right? But I've gone around to many, many cities and towns. Air emissions is a real issue. Okay? You talk to mayors, you talk to anybody on, on the, in, in the city council, air emissions is a real issue. And most cities, 40 to 50% of all emissions are tailpipe emissions. Okay? And they not only uh, create issues about health, uh, but they're real jobs. Houston, for example, has still not gotten over the fact that we lost the Toyota plant to San Antonio. And the only reason Houston lost that Toyota plant to San Antonio was because we could not meet the air emission standards. And another factory was not allowed. Okay? So air emissions to people in the city council, mayors, all of the policymakers at the local city level, it's a real issue. Okay? And I'm, these, are, these are figures from uh, EPA and Federal Highway Administration and, uh, and uh, other sources. And the argument has always been, yes, but how do you produce the electricity, right? And this is a, what we call the well-to-wheels analysis. So you look at how do you produce gasoline, you know, uh, transport it, refine it, uh, truck it to your local gas st station, fuel it, right? Similarly on gasoline, if it's gas-fired, you, you, you know, uh, exploration production, uh, transport it, uh, it, it, it to the power plant, burn it, and then you, you get your electrons, right? So when you look at a well-to-wheels analysis, even an electric vehicle, if the, your source is 100% from coal, is still cleaner than an elect, uh, than a, uh, internal combustion engine car. Any electric vehicle is cleaner. Okay. Now in Texas, I don't know if you know this or not, but we have the most wind, more wind than any other state. We have 10,000 megawatts of wind in 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 uh, Texas. And wind blows mostly at night. And electric vehicle charging is done mostly at night. So more than likely, you know, there's very, very strong correlation between nighttime wind production and nighttime electric vehicle charging. So you could be actually be on this part, uh, the solar wind hydronuclear source, where you could be, you could be emitting zero uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions uh, from your electric vehicle. Okay. So any electric vehicle, even when powered by 100% coal, is cleaner than a gasoline car. This is, a, this is a research from Oak Ridge National Lab that shows cost of oil dependence to, to the U.S. economy. Okay? More than $500 billion worth. There was another amazing study from Rand Corporation, which is actually very well known in the defense circles. Their analysis was that we as a country spend $75 billion a year just defending our oil lanes, just protecting our oil lanes. We're spending $75 billion a year, okay? And then you, you, uh, on top of that, you, you look at the dislocation losses, loss of potential GDP. Their analysis was uh, over $500 billion last year. So we're sending more than a billion dollars a day outside our country every day. So it's a major national security issue. I mean, there's been a lot of books that have been written out there, and I'm not trying to you know, uh, go on one side or the other, that, that show that every war that's been fought has been over natural resources, over, over fuel so far. Okay? So this is a major, major issue from a national security perspective. So let me get away from the policy issues. I can come back to any questions you may have on the policy. So let me go around to more corporate. Okay? Uh, corporate and startup. And I, I understand my CEO was here 
earlier this year, so I'm hoping I don't say anything different from what he said. So uh, we are a large energy company of Fortune 300 company, right? And it's, it's a very fascinating, fascinating uh, company in many ways. And, and you may hear all kinds of things about how difficult it is for these large energy companies to change. You know, you've got these assets that last for 40, 50, 60 years. You cannot turn on a dime. But if this is an example of a company that has changed, okay? Three years ago, only three years ago, every one of our dollars came from carbon generating sources because we are a generating company, right? You turn your lights on, you, it needs to come from somewhere. We, ge we have a, around 25,000 megawatts of generation. In, 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 in a, another way to put that, that would power maybe around 20 million homes in the United States, okay? So we're a large generating company. And our CEO decided at that point that, look, there's a lot of changes coming in, both from a, from a consumer end, uh, folks that want greener forms of energy, as well as from uh, regulatory and policy perspectives. And we don't want to be in, in a fetal position waiting for that to happen, but we, we want to make the change happen. And just three years ago, we went down this path and said, we want to maximize our earnings from non-carbon generating sources. So in just those three years, Today, we're the largest investor in the United States in solar. Okay? We have invested more than $1.5 billion in solar. We own 500 megawatts of wind. Uh, we own a company just right here headquartered in Austin called Green Mountain Energy, which is owned by NRG as well. We, we sell only green, uh, green products. Okay? Uh, and then finally, we have these two companies, EVgo, which I'll talk about more in detail. And EV2G, I'm not going to talk about that more in, in, in so much detail, but EV2G is really something vehicle to grid. It's not going to be here today. It's not going to be here tomorrow. But you think about two different facts, right? A car, on average, drives only 31 miles a day, okay? Even today, people talk about range anxiety. The batteries today are already 100 miles. So you already have excess generating capacity in your battery, right? You combine that with the fact that, on average, a car sits parked 23 hours a day, okay? And now, if you plug that car in, you suddenly have, you know, potentially millions of generating sources, okay? The technology is not challenging, okay? In Japan, the vehicle to home already works, vehicle to grid already works. The technology is not the challenge, but there's going to be a lot of regulatory and a lot of commercial things that need to be worked out for that to really take off. So, but... I can see in five to seven years that your car, your electric vehicle, is not only going to be a, 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 a cost item on your ledger, but you could be making money out of your electric vehicle. Okay? Already today, and EV2G is a joint venture that we have with the University of Delaware. They had done a lot of research over 20 years on, on that space, and they wanted to commercialize their whole technology, so that's the reason for the joint venture. So in the Northeast, already we've done a pilot project that had, with eight batteries, they were stationary batteries, but we showed with the PGM grid, uh, with demand response and frequency regulation and all those kinds of uh, on, on the grid uh, demand management uh, issues, we were able to show uh, with, for each battery monthly revenues of anywhere between 100 to 200 uh, dollars. Okay? So it's, it's, it's in sight. It's not today, it's not tomorrow, but maybe five years that your, your electric vehicle, may, you may be making money out of your electric vehicle. Okay. So uh, uh, we have achieved around a 29% reduction in greenhouse gas uh, emissions, and what is more important, I think, is the fact that you know, you know, we have the cards we've, we're dealt with, right? But the question is, what do we do with our investments, our free cash flow? And almost every, all of that free cash flow has been invested in green uh, energy the last few years. So what is EVGO? This is my second startup. My, my first startup was in the solar space, uh, and it's fascinating difference. Uh, the solar uh, industry was really financed by uh, private equity. This is a startup within a large Fortune uh, 300 company. It's a, it's a fascinating uh, difference how, how, how the two work. But when we looked at this space, we thought electric vehicles were really, really important for many reasons. And we wanted to get in that space. So the question is, the first thing you need to ask yourself is, what is the value proposition? What are you going to provide? Right? And when we kind of looked at the space, 
we thought there were three things we thought. We didn't know, obviously, right? We thought there were three things that we as an energy company were very well suited to solve. The first is what everybody calls range anxiety, right? You get an electric vehicle, there's no gas station, you know, you run out of juice, what do you do, right? Uh, problem number one. The other is cost of uh, upfront cost. Even after you buy an electric vehicle, it can cost you anywhere from $2,000 to $3,000 to install a home charger, okay? So significant cost. And the third thing was nobody, <laughs> or unless you've been in the energy space for a lo long time or you're an energy geek, you know, people really do not know uh, the association of kilowatt hours and mileage and cost, okay? And people don't want to figure it out. Okay. So we thought the easiest model that we could come up with a was a subscription model, you know, people are, are used to it in, in the telecom world. So we came up with a subscription model that essentially bundled all of those three, right? And, and that was, we thought, a value proposition that we, we could go to market with. And so that's how we started around two years ago. This is, this is the, you know, I just want to kind of show uh, progression of a startup company, right? So it's been two years. We launched in November of 2010. Uh, Mayor Anis Parker of Houston was there. Uh, we signed our first customer on Thanksgiving Day, in fact, uh, in, in, in uh, 2010, when there were no EVs out there. Okay? People were signing up f on, on faith alone. That is all they had. Right? Um, January 2011, President Obama, at the, on, on the State of the Union address, pledges 1 million EVs on U.S. roads by 2015. Are we going to reach it or not? Don't know. Uh, April 2011, we launched in... in, in, in uh, North Texas, Dallas, Fort Worth, uh, with uh, uh, Governor Perry was out there. Uh, we installed, September 2011 was the first, we call them Freedom Station. Um, we then announced expansion into DC metro area. Uh, then we go into uh, California, and I'm gonna show you some of the other pictures. Uh, but it's really, you know, we started with two or three people, okay? So we had to, create a business model, create all the kind of systems processes, uh, you know, customer touch points, just a million things. And then create, build a lot of this infrastructure at the same time. Uh, it, it, one of the things, th if you enjoy doing a lot of different things at the same time, okay, and you love working 18 hours a day, I strongly recommend startups for you, okay? It's a lot of fun, uh, but it's a different kind of fun. Um, this is what we call a freedom station. Now, if you're in Houston or Dallas, Fort Worth uh, today, there's a level two charger, the one on the left, the level uh, DC charger, the one on the right. Uh, this is a real one, it's not a mock-up. Uh, level two gives you in an hour, maybe around what, uh, four to six miles of, 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 uh, of range. Uh, DC is a very fast charge. Uh, in 15 minutes, you get 50 miles, okay? Very fast charge, so when you're outside, you know, you don't want to be, you know, hanging around for two, three, four hours. You want to get a quick charge, move on. So we have uh, these uh, freedom stations you know, around Houston and Dallas, Fort Worth now, and soon to in, in California and uh, Washington, D.C. metro area. So typically they're in front of, you know, we want a good retail engagement. So Walgreens, for example, uh, HEB, for example, Whole Foods, uh, Cracker Barrel, uh, where you can enjoy your chicken dumplings while you're charging your food, charging your car, right? It's a, <laughs> some pretty uh, iconic uh, retail host. So this is our, our uh, ecosystem in Houston. And it's already today the most extensive network anywhere in the U.S., okay? We've got 16 freedom stations, uh, like you can maybe you'll see some of the signs with Walgreens and HEB and others. Now, the other thing that we're trying to build is a very comprehensive ecosystem. And what do I mean by that? I mean, you get into the heads of, of the drivers and you say, okay, where do you need one, right? So, for example, you know, earlier this week I was in New York City. So I, I drove to uh, Intercontinental uh, Airport, parked at the park and fly. We got our chargers there, plugged it in, went to New York City, came back. I now have a fully charged car I can get back home to. Otherwise, I'd be stranded. I could not get home without having been able to charge a parking flight. So it's really about a complete ecosystem. Public charging, home charging, workplace charging, uh, multifamily charging, uh, convenience charging. So really trying to make it as easy as possible to the point where as we keep on building it, you will not be more than 10 miles away from the next charging station. So we're trying to make sure that people have 
full range confidence, right? This is in, in Dallas, Fort Worth. We now have uh, 15 stations online. The 16th is under construction. And, and uh, again, the, the idea is to you know, make sure that whenever you are on uh, far affairs in the, in the Dallas, Fort Worth area, that you're going to be not further than 10 miles or so uh, from, from the next charging station. And California, 40% of all electric vehicles so far are going to California. Okay? 80% of all investments in the electric vehicle industry, in the industry, is going to California. And the California state government has extremely strong policy uh, backing. Uh, the governor has announced a mandate. Okay? Uh, this is not a policy. It's a mandate uh, called the Zero Emissions Vehicles, ZEV mandate, that will result in 1.5 million uh, zero emission vehicles in the state of California by the year 2025. Okay? Otherwise, there's fairly aggressive penalties on, on the car manufacturers. Uh, just last week, he signed legislation that gives single access EV drivers, single, single driver uh, uh, vehicles, single driver EVs, access to HOV lanes and free access to HOT lanes. Okay? So this very, very strong regulatory and policy framework in the state of California already. And so we've announced a more than a $100 million investment in the state of California. So what are the cons consumer offers? I mean, it's, it's really fascinating because, again, you know, we have nothing to learn from. I mean, it's a new industry, new uh, space. So earlier when I thought those three value propositions, we decided to bundle them together. Similar to a cell phone, I guess, if, if there's one industry we learn from, it's probably the, the, the cell phone industry. And so one of the, the things we offer is, is, is what you call $89 a month complete plan. So with that, you know, we go into people's homes, do a free home assessment, install a 240-volt smart home charger, give you a key fob that gives you access to all the public charging stations and all the electricity you consume at $89 a month. And so that, we thought, solved the three major barriers of, for, for electric vehicle owners, right? Range anxiety. So you have access to all these freedom stations, right? No range anxiety. Uh, cost of ownership, well, you pay zero upfront, okay? So there's no cost of ownership. And, you know, your unknown cost factor. Well, once you sign, you know even in month 36, you know exactly how much you're paying a month, which is $89 a month. Now, most people benchmark that, obviously, with gasoline prices. So, you know, people think about 150 to $200 a month. So it compares extremely well. And with that, you're not only getting your gasoline equivalent, you're also getting your gas pump at home. Right? So we thought it was a pretty good deal. And... It's been proven that it's been a pretty good deal because this, last year when we introduced this business model, we had 83% close rate. What that means is that 83% of the consumers we had access to selected an e-vehicle plan. This year, that number has jumped to 95%. So we know the product sells, right? We just need to, but this, this kind of business is only work in scale. So we need, we need to have a lot more EV adoption for this kind of business to be success, truly successful. Even though we know the product is, is successful, the business cannot be successful without scale. How am I uh, doing with time? OK. Um, we spend actually a lot of time on consumer awareness. And, and a lot of folks, especially two years ago, uh, when we started uh, in, in this biz business, you know, when you talk electric vehicle, this first thought was golf cart, right? So that was the starting point. And so what we decided to do was uh, go out there in a lot of different consumer-facing events, from, from, uh, from the Houston rodeo to uh, auto shows to um, you know, pet shows, you name it. Uh, in, in fact, I, th I think we spent like 261 days of public awareness uh, campaigns. Okay? And what we typically would do is take what we, an EVgo 10 with a couple of EVs, you know, usually a mass vehicle, electric vehicle, like a Nissan Leaf or, or a, a Chevy Volt, and we take a couple of chargers and our network map and just talk to people. You know? Here's what an electric vehicle looks like. You can sit in one. Here's how the charging works. Here, you know, here's how it all works. And we did a lot of surveys. And it's very fascinating, you know, and one question we asked both before and after was, would you consider buying an electric vehicle as part of your next auto purchase? 
And depending upon the forum we'd be in, the typical answer would be anywhere from 5 to 20 percent. Yes, I would even consider okay, buying an electric vehicle. Once they went through that process of being familiar with an electric vehicle, that number jumped to like 55 to 60 percent. So consumer awareness is really, really, really critical, uh, especially in the next probably, even in the next uh, couple of years, because there's all kinds of myths, all kinds of questions about electric vehicles. The first thing, I, I was at one of these forums, by the way, uh, organized by the Wall Street Journal out in Dallas. So I was giving the talk, and, and after the talk, this, this gentleman, in, in maybe in his mid-50s, runs up to the stage and says, Arun, you forgot to say one thing. I said, what? He said, you forgot to mention how much fun they are. I said, okay. So, so then he started telling me a story about, you know, he, he used to drive a Porsche, and he, he, he traded that in for a Nissan Leaf, and he's never had any regrets. And, you know, it's an instant torque, it's a quiet drive, and it's so much fun to drive. Uh, so so I, he's reminding me to, every time I talk to anybody, to remind folks about how much fun they are. So you should drive, you should try one if you've never tried one, okay? Um, and basically, what, what it showed is that, you know, a lot of the surveys really uh, validated some of our assumptions as well. Actually, there was one other major assumption uh, we had. Because we are spending a lot of money in these freedom stations. They're very expensive. And so these are upfront investments. We, need, we knew we needed to make that investment. We had no clue would people want to buy them or not, or would people want to use them or not? Are people just going to charge at home? No clue, right? And so the, one of the major validations we have in, in, in the last one year is that of all the plans we, consumer plans we have out there, some of them have... Uh, uh, plans that give you uh, uh, access to public charging, others don't. And so far, 75% of our consumers choose plans that has access, give them access to uh, the network. So huge validation, because public charging, you can look upon it as an insurance policy. But the big question in our, in our mind was, well, would, would people pay for the insurance policy or not, right? So that was a huge part of our uh, validation. And, and really, this is the final slide uh, we have a lot of partners because everything we do from, from uh, retail hosts, the you know, Cracker Barrels, HEBs, Walgreens, uh, to you know, auto industry partners, power provider partners, we actually have some pretty interesting um, car sharing programs. We, we've, uh, we're working with, um, oh, it's not even here, Enterprise in, in Houston and Dallas, Fort Worth. Um, and we just signed one with Zipcar last week, in fact, uh, to work with Zipcar in uh, California. And we're working with Hertz in uh, San Antonio. So car sharing, electric vehicle car sharing is a really, really interesting concept because the, I think the demographic works very well. Uh, a lot of the folks who want to do uh, car sharing are also, you know, uh, this similar kind of demographic that's very interested in electric vehicles. So we're trying to combine the two as well. So that's really what I have. So uh, probably open it up to questions, uh, Varun. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for the talk. I, I guess my question is kind of uh, something you alluded to at the beginning about behavior change. And I, I think that one of the concerns that people have is maybe too much behavior too soon, like to have the uh, range anxiety, right. along with the fact that the battery technology isn't there to charge you up as, you, as, as a convenience factor, right. and that people would be willing to pay more for that convenience factor, even if it means uh, a dollar more gallon gasoline than it than uh, the marginal cost for electricity. How do you kind of um, go about bringing that behavior change, and what sort of uh, methodologies do you think will work for that? Well, first thing we've learned, look, is, is that behavior change takes time, right? You know, we were out there sitting two years ago, you know, and us and the auto manufacturers and everybody else said, you know, thinking, when was the hockey stick going to happen, right? Uh, you know, uh, you, you introduce the, the uh, EVs. When are we going to see a massive, uh, you know, uptake in adoption? Um, and we, you know, probably being too much in the electric vehicle space, having driven electric vehicles and seen all these kind of uh, stats and experienced the stats, I guess we were much too optimistic. And, and, and today we look back and say, you know what, it's, it's, 
too much of a different thing. You know, we might think, having driven one for you know a couple of years, that that it's simple. You know, you're just like no different than charging a cell phone, but it's different, right? And so first lesson is that it takes time. Uh, the other thing about electric vehicles, of course, is that it's your second largest purchase, right? Vehicles after your house, it's the second largest purchase, and people buy a car every five or six years. So it takes time to sink in, and you know, before you make your next purchase consideration and all those kind of things. At NRG, for example, you know, we offer people, you know, besides the seventy-five hundred dollar tax rate and all that, we offer our own company offers us two thousand dollars, growth, you know, grossed up, as an incentive to buy an electric vehicle, and. And we see slow uptake even at energy, even with the additional incentives, right? Uh, so, that, so that's one. Uh, consumer awareness is very important. Uh, I guess there, I'm sure there will be external factors, like you know, as people get more aware of you know, the, the environmental issues and, and cost factors and those kind of things, I'm sure it, it's, it's going to get into people's behaviors as well. So I think a whole lot of things need to come together. I don't know if that's, that was an answer or not, but... <laughs> Hi. I, was, I was curious as to how you would expect the uh, EV market to respond to rising rare earth element and uh, metallic and metalloid uh, battery component components. Okay, so I'm not the expert on rare earth. Okay, but I've been told by by uh, battery manufacturers and uh, car OEMs, uh, including some of some of the you know uh, bigger ones out there that. I don't know if that was part of your question or not, is that rear earth is, is out there a lot. It's, it's never going to be a, a constraint, right? Uh, and, and that the rear earth uh, environmental issues are not really existing, okay? I, I'll be honest with you, it's not an area that I can really reply to, but I, I feel fairly comfortable having talked with a lot of the OEMs and battery manufacturers and, and okay, they may they may have their own axe to grind, but but you know even looking at some of the uh, research reports from the Argon National Lab and and Brookhaven and and places like that, uh, I'm pretty comfortable with with that. Hi, um, thank you so much for being here. My question is about your business model and how dependent it is on continued subsidies. Um, even though even though the amount is nominal relative to say what the other big three recently got, um, just the optics around the industry being so sensitive. Right. Um, yeah. Okay. Our own particular business model, we don't depend on subsidies. Okay. Well, EVgo has not received a penny in in government subsidies. Uh, it, this is a totally commercial business model and sustainable business model. Okay. Now. Uh, if you talk about subsidies, there's a $7,500 tax credit from, from uh, the federal government, right? And certain states have put their own uh, tax credits in place as well. California has $2,500. West Virginia has $5,000, by the way. So the best place to buy an EV today is go to West Virginia, buy it, and ship it wherever, wherever you, <laughs> you want to ship it. Uh, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm amazed myself. I mean, in the coal heavy state like uh, West Virginia has the the highest subsidies uh, today, right? So yes, there's subsidies. Is it important? Look, I mean, in a nascent industry like uh, like EVs uh, industry right now, sure, it's important. Any dollar helps. But I think the way the federal government has done it is that there is a sunset, right? So it's the first 200,000 cars from uh, EVs from any manufacturers. So manufacturers know that it's not going to last forever. But what it's doing, it's it's incentivize them to produce electric vehicles as fast as possible, get down the, the, the economies of scale curve, and you know, bring down their cost. It's a huge incentivizer for that. And look, you know, at, I don't know what your views are, industrial policy and government policy and all that, but you know, I went to the University of Chicago, which is as right of a school as, as, <laughs> as, as you'll get. But uh, government policy drives a lot of things, right? If, if, as a nation, we want to be preeminent in the, quite a number of industries which are really key industries to our growth, from auto industry to battery management industry, and batteries are really, really key to a lot of other things as well. Okay? 
you need to do something. And again, it's, it's a global world. You need to compete with the Chinas and the other countries that are investing billions of dollars into that space as well. So, you know, uh, I think the subsidies are important right now for the auto industry, but at least our business model does not depend on government subsidies at all. Um, a couple of questions. The first one was, how do you see with the incre increase of EVs, how is the grid actually going to, you know, if it's really increasing the amount you said at the beginning, yeah. how is the, grease, the grid going to handle yeah, that yeah, yeah. within the next 20 years? Yeah, yeah, yeah first question and the other question was you mentioned your plans in terms of per month uh, home base right. but how do cus consumers actually see that in their electric bill what's the the big difference okay. there okay. sure the sure so uh first question is actually a pretty easy one that was something that there was a lot of noise out there in, in the marketplace okay an electric vehicle uses three megawatt hours a year okay it's like when you charge it it's like your equivalent to your dryer, clothes dryer. So it's not a big load, okay? The world is not gonna come down with a lot of electric vehicles. There's more than enough capacity on the grid. A center point, for example, the, the, the uh, grid operator in the larger Houston area came up with a study that says, we can handle 250,000 EVs without making any change. And similar, the, you know, the Encore did, did a similar kind of study. It's really a non-issue. There, there may be pockets, where you know, a sub-transfer may need to be upgraded or something of the sort, but hey, you know, when, you, when you get an AC in your neighborhood you know, and the, the utility doesn't complain about having to upgrade the, the transformer, why should they complain when you, know, you get an EV and you have to upgrade the transformer, right? Uh, so I really think it's, it's a non-issue. Uh, your second question was uh, about consumers, right? Um, what do they see on the bill? So what they do is actually they send a different bill to us to, to uh, uh, EVgo. Uh, now, there are th over 3,000 utilities in, in the United States, right? Some of them are investor-owned utilities, you've got co-ops, you've got munis, you've got uh, all kinds, and then there's people like us, everything we do is in the competitive space. Uh, we're a you know, competitive generator, competitive retailer. Um, in, in Austin, you've got one source for your electricity, right? In Houston, I've got a choice of 40 different retail electricity providers. Uh, so it, it's, it's a v much larger uh, uh, choice market. So, so if you're a customer, you get your monthly bill, uh, your utility bill, you send us another monthly bill for you know, 59 or 79 or whatever it uh, might be. Now, very interesting, the complete plan actually reimburses you, you for your home electricity as well. So what happens is, on your utility bill, if let's say you, ch you charge $120 a month, your utility bill would show $120, if that, that was the total charge, minus $20, $100. You pay $100 to the utility, you pay the usual $89 to us, we reimburse the $20 to the utility. Hi, I, I'm over here, sorry. Um, I heard you say, so I just wanna ask sort of a follow-up to the previous question. Uh, about government policy, and it sounded like you were basically saying that the driver of market creation has helped to drive the innovation, and I guess the question becomes, what, what do you see, if, if you all are operating without subsidies, or you, know, you don't see that as being a big issue for your business model, what will drive your innovation? What, what will keep, if the adoption rate is where it's at right now, where do you see the drivers behind added investment in the industry and you know, added efficiencies in the vehicles. Right. So, and your question, if I uh, understand it correctly, was with, ref uh, with regard to typical EVgo in particular, right? So there's two major drivers. Uh, one is EV adoption, right? Uh, because as EV adoption grows, uh, we need to be able to serve different kinds of uh, drivers, right? And the second is consumers. It's pretty amazing how every consumer wants a business plan, wants a plan that's tailored to their exact needs. And so when we started out, we started out with three plans. Okay, when we launched back in November 2010, before there were any electric vehicles and people were signing up on, on, on faith, right, alone. Uh, we now have, I believe, 10 or 12 different plans. 
Uh, because people start saying, okay, I drive a lot. I, I, want a, I want to charge at the other end as well. So, you know, well, what if I get a charge at both home and workplace? You know, how much is that going to cost me? You know, like I want one only for, uh, I'll do my own level one charging. I, want, I just want a key fob for your public charging stations. So consumers will primarily really drive our innovation. Uh, and, and over time, I'm sure there's the competitive element as well, right? I mean, uh, we're, the reason we're a first mover, let's face it, is because we believe, rightly or wrongly, that this industry is going to take off. First mover gives us huge advantage in terms of experience. I'm, I cannot begin to tell you about how much we've learned in the last two years. Uh, we've invested a lot in this space, and uh, we'll either lose a whole bunch of money or, or we'll you know, do very well in terms of uh, ser serving the industry. But it, it, is, it is a major risk. It is a, it is a large capital investment we're making. Look, I'm, a, a lot of your you know, DNA for, for any company is, is a broader context, right? I mean, the, our parent company is used to you know, spending hundreds of million dollars building power plants, taking you know, five or ten years of permitting and, and construction risk. So compared to that, this is actually much lower risk uh, capital, right? Uh, the, the amount of the capital expenditure is just less. If I understand your question correctly, Richard, I mean, it was over between the electric industry and the natural gas industry, well, or? Let's not uh, make the table again, but right, 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 right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm pretty confident that if that investment in the upstream side continues to happen, more on the electric vehicle uh, side and industry and the, and the uh, battery industry, I'm pretty confident that there's, there's going to be enough investment on the downstream side. As, as, as uh, people, investors see more EV adoption, the, the, the EV infrastructure, even though it may be capital exp uh, uh, significant capital expenditure compared to how much it is on the EV industry and on the uh, battery side, it's much less in comparison. So I'm fairly confident that, that that's not going to be an issue if there's uh, enough of an EV adoption. Hi, I have a question about the home charging stations. Yeah. Um, you mentioned so it was $89 a month, but you yeah. said it was zero money up front. Right. So is that $89? Uh, Over three is that, years. I'm sorry if I didn't mention that. It's a subscription plan. It's a three-year subscription plan. Okay, so yeah. part of the home charging cost of installation and the materials and everything is built into the 89? Sure. Okay, so I have another question about home charging stations. Um, so you said wind blows primarily at night, which is true, mm -hmm. and that Texas has more wind than anybody else in the, in the union. That's true, too. Right. Um, but it's not very consistent. Have you ever thought about having, like, a solar panel that's on top of a roof and that charges your station to charge your car? It, it's it, you know it's a very interesting question. In California, for example, uh, sixty percent of electric vehicle owners have some form of solar on on their uh, homes. So there's actually very strong correlation between the demographics of people who are buying EVs and those who are uh, you know getting solar rooftops. Now, you know, we can actually do a lot of things with with, with those uh, uh, freedom station in terms of adding a canopy, a solar canopy. Uh, and all kinds of stuff, right? But ultimately, it's going to in incur a lot more cost. So $89 will have to be 129 perhaps or $139 perhaps. Our consumer is going to be willing to pay that much more for you know, solar uh, canopies, things of the sort. So I, I think there's a lot more better story on the solar rooftops and EV charging. Yeah, thanks. Um, 
it's well known that consumers use very high discount rates when evaluating um, energy investments. And in your business plan, you mentioned um, three of the value propositions are able to provide reducing risk, um, this subscription plan. Uh, it seems like the, the huge upfront cost, though, is still the cost of the vehicle itself. Sure. And I'm wondering, um, do you offer any partnerships where, for example, you um, lease the vehicle but then bundle your subscription service in that? And then yeah. can you say more about yeah. your partnership with the vehicle makers themselves? We're, we're working on that. There's actually some financing uh, rules and regulations that make it challenging right now. Uh, but that, that is something we're working on. Uh, there's one another possibility, uh, without going into a little, lot more detail on, 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 from a business model perspective, is you, know, you, can, you can perhaps see a business model where you're separating the battery from the car itself, right? And, and so you know, instead of paying you know, $28,000 for a Nissan Leaf, for example, you, know, you separate out the battery, which may cost around, let's say, $14,000. So you buy the car for you know, $14,000, you lease your battery, and you make your monthly payment. So that way, your upfront cost on the vehicle itself is much lower. So it's your sticker price, right? What most consumers buy cars on, uh, on it gets much lower. So that is a possibility. There's a number of companies that are looking into that. Uh, again, it, it, there, there's more uh, issues are more things like warranty and those kind of issues uh, complicate that quite a bit, but it may, may not be unworkable, let me put it that way. It, there, 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 there's a possibility that something like that could happen. So I, I see up there you have a level two charger and a DC charger. Yeah. And I noticed uh, recently that Tesla announced their supercharger. Yeah. Talk, talk to me about standards right. Right. in right. the right. charging right. station right. realm and, right. and uh, what might do to right. consumer right. confusion and whatnot. So uh, there's really three uh, levels of charging, right? You've got level one, 120 volts, level two, 240 volts, uh, DC fast charging, more like 40, 480 volts, three phase power. Um, and uh, you know, level one is your, you know, your home socket, right? When you charge your electric vehicle, it's the equivalent power draw of a hair dryer, for example. I don't need one, but for those who, who, who use one, it's that, that's, that's equivalent for a hair dryer. Uh, level two, 240 volt, uh, equivalent of, of a dryer, uh, clothes uh, dryer. And then DC charger is more like a, maybe a small, uh, maybe, 8,000 square foot office space. It's a fairly small, right? It's not, it's not a major uh, requirement. Um, and level two is standardized. There's a standard called J1772, so everybody uses the same standard, right? DC charging is where it's getting really interesting, and it's almost like your, for those of you who may remember, it's almost like the you know, VHS versus Betamax uh, wire that was there in WordMuse is like this for those of us who remember, maybe in the 80s, maybe. <laughs> uh, and, and so right now, there's, there's a, the Japanese have introduced a standard called CHAdeMO. Uh, there's over 8,000 DC chargers in Japan, so there's, there's already a lot, you know, big uh, uh, number out there. And we're just starting here in the US, so that's the only standard that's available. So we're right now just uh, putting in CHAdeMO standard chargers. There's a Society for Automotive Engineers which is meeting right now still, uh, which is planning to come up with a different standard. Uh, we don't know yet exactly what that standard is going to be, and even more important, when EVs with that standard ports are going to be introduced, because cars, it takes at least three years from the time you finalize the design on a car, you freeze it, and then the whole process starts, supply chain, manufacturing, all those things, it takes three years. So, so the cars that are going to be introduced in 2015 have been frozen already and have gone into the production process. So the earliest that we can think an electric vehicle with the SAE standard is going to come into the market is maybe 6, 2016, right? So our plan is to just go with the Chatham charger. Again, our business model is to try to serve every electric vehicle out there, right? So what we've done is we've actually plumbed this uh, Freedom Station area with all the wiring for a second DC charger as well. So if the second, uh, if the SAE standard uh, you know, becomes a predominant one, we're just going to put it on another uh, DC charger. Makes it problematic, but it's the way it is. 
So uh, you mentioned a, you put a lot of emphasis on company, cu customer awareness and behavior change, and it seems like consumers are really driven by uh, convenience and fear. And so when you look at uh, the convenience, the value proposition of, of what's more convenience, convenient between an uh, EV and a traditional conventional uh, gas car. The last question uh, being about standards, um, it seems like standardization would be kind of the, would, would lead to the most convenience, right? Um, I know that y'all aren't on the manufacturing side, but working with these companies, with y'all's partners, did, did you ever look at the better place model or, or were there any conversations about that where, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you're switching the batteries out mm -hmm. as opposed to charging them mm -hmm. so that it's the same thing as pulling mm -hmm. into the mm -hmm. gas station, mm -hmm. switching the batteries and going? Right, right. So uh, the better place model, for those who may not uh, know it, it, involves essentially switching the batteries. So, uh, so they've got, they have a large you know, battery switching uh, infrastructure where you drive in, um, and within, I believe, it's like five minutes, they, uh, the machine takes out the existing battery, uh, puts in a fully charged battery in place, and off you go. The issue with, with that model is really twofold. Uh, the first is that that infrastructure is extremely expensive. Okay? You know, if compared to this, think about you know, maybe 10x or 20x, okay? It's, it's very, very expensive. The other huge issue, and I come from the energy space, so I'm learning about the auto industry myself as well, right? So, so somebody told me a very interesting story. Uh, they said, you know, back after the Second World War, uh, some of the auto manufacturers sat down together and decided, you know what, if we can standardize some of the key parts, we can all enjoy the economies of scale and pass on the savings to the consumer. Great idea, right? And so they started with, with uh, the, the headlights, right? Pretty simple, okay, nobody's gonna you know, go to war over headlights. Well, they've been meeting since 1955. Okay? They cannot standardize on headlights, right? So think about now, the, 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 trying to standardize about you know, the size of the battery, where that battery is gonna be placed in the car, how that battery gets taken out, what kind of battery gets back in, and the GMs and the Fords and the Toyotas and everybody saying, okay, we're gonna, all gonna do according to better place specs, right? That's the challenge. This one, you don't need to do anything different. You don't have to, you, you know, you, you don't have to, the, the auto manufacturers don't have to go to war <laughs> with each other to do for, for this. <laughs> that was an amazing discussion. Let's thank okay. everyone.